Looking for strategies to help you protect your portfolio in these uncertain times? Visit robblack.com. Robblack.com. Powered by EP Wealth. A lot going on on Wall Street these days. How are you doing? The year is moving quickly. We're already into February. Love Day is right around the corner. Got lots to think about. Um, Loud budgeting is a new term that we have to start thinking about. Loud budgeting is having a moment. TikTok's latest financial trend can be as simple as saying, hey, I don't want to spend money right now, rather than modeling your purchases after Gwyneth Paltrow and other celebrities who have bottomless pockets. I get that. I think that's actually a really good thing because it's starting to show some constraint. Now, how about Super Bowl tickets? Are we doing any constraint there? Nope. The get-in price is hovering around $7,700, almost $7,800, $7,790. That's a pretty big number. I bring that up in large part for three hours of entertainment. I guess exclusive bragging rights that you're in. The Super Bowl is L-V-I-I-I. Roman numerals. Remember Roman numerals from when you were in elementary school? Did those really serve any purpose in our life later on? at and is doing something pretty cool. They're launching an anti-robocall service. I did not know this. Tell me if this surprises you. Surprises me. 80% of Americans won't answer a phone call if it's an unknown number. I think I'm in that I think I'm in that number. I, I didn't realize I was in that number. I didn't realize that number was that high. Spam and robocalls make up more than a quarter of all US phone calls. They've changed the way we use our phone. Last week, AT&T, in partnership with TransUnion, announced a branded call service that verifies rings from legit businesses by displaying their name and logo on screen. If other carriers start to fall into place, that would be a positive. There's over 4 billion robocalls a a month. Vote for me. I will ban robocalls. I know you're saying, what about Israel and Palestine? What about Russia and Ukraine? What about taxes on the wealthy? Nope. My platform is I will ban robocalls. The FCC has received 1.2 million complaints about robocalls last year. Can you imagine calling the FCC? Who are these 1.2 million people who complain? I just don't have time in my day for that. I guess um, probably over 65, right? 25,000 AI-generated robocalls impersonated President Biden, urging voters not to vote, spread through New Hampshire last month. The FCC implemented some semi-successful robocall countermeasures, including mandating that carriers like Verizon, Comcast, and T-Mobile implement anti-scam call tech in 2021. Just an 8% drop in robocalls was the result. So it's really not there. Yesterday, something pretty cool was announced. You tell me if you think this is pretty cool or not. ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers are going to launch a joint sports streaming platform this year. So it's going to be this year, which is fast. It's three of the biggest companies. Notably missing is Comcast. With Comcast, you know my bill when I quit, and I was only getting HBO and Showtime. Oh, and I was also getting internet. It was $250 a month. I was, I was on their digital tier, so I got high definition, blah, blah, blah. So a couple of years ago, I quit because it was just too much money. It's not that I didn't have it. It was just too much money. So ESPN, Fox, and Warner Brothers are going to copy what was successful with Hulu, which if you've used Hulu, it's kind of like a Comcast cable box. But instead of having 1,000 channels, it has 60 or 50. So Disney, Fox, and Warner Brothers, each will own one-third of stake in broadcast uh, partners will be like ESPN, ESPN2, SEC Network, ACC Network, ABC, Fox, FS1, FS2, Big Ten Network, TNT, True TV, and ESPN Plus, as well as TBS. So they're covering a lot of sports there. It'll be done through an app. It'll probably be 45 or 50 bucks a month. Probably going to have something like a, a $25 or $20 three-month sign-up kind of thing. In theory, they'll probably make partnerships with companies like the Tennis Channel, who is an independent network. That could be added to it for the total sports enthusiast. I like it. I like the idea of um, 
Hulu in that where you don't have to get, I, I know it starts to get expensive when you start putting those two together. Right. <clears throat> but sports is the thing that we center live entertainment around. It's still relevant. This would do a big ding to the company like Comcast cable. Any of the cable companies, this would hit hard. Um, is it enough sports? Will it have regional sports? There's still a lot of questions to be answered. Because I do like my regional baseball, for instance. Wall Street might want to put on some protective glasses as it watches Eli Lilly eclipse Tesla. So the moon and the sun, it's not a solar eclipse. It's a Wall Street eclipse. After surpassing Elon Musk's EV company and market cap last month, America's biggest drug maker reported rock star revenue. It's obesity and diabetes medications. Zepbound was only on sale for about a month in the quarter, and it was a blockbuster. Mongerno also obviously helped the better than expected quarterly numbers. They pulled in $9.3 billion in revenue. Profit was up 13%. That's in large part thanks to Eli Lilly being able to charge more than before for Mongerno and selling $175 million worth of Zepbound in just a month. Lilly stocks are 19% this year. They are opening a new manufacturing facility in North Carolina, trying to get as much of it into the market as they can. Eli Lilly executives are worried. The company's capacity to make two drugs might be impacted by the parent of Ozempic maker Novo Nordisk, planning to buy pharmaceutical supplier Catalent. That was a smart move by Novo Nordisk. So there is a manufacturing problem. The drugs will sell as many as they can make. Um, I've thought about it. Uh, If my recent diet, which and exercise and different approach doesn't work, I would strongly consider it. I can keep weight off. That's the thing, though, with these weight uh, drugs is they say people can't keep weight off. Um, I don't have strange eating habits. Like I, I don't have urges for things like pizza or ice cream in the middle of the night. Anytime you want to talk about Wall Street, we can talk about Wall Street. Anytime you want to talk about investing in insurance, drop me an email, rob, robblackshow.com. We can talk about earning more money, saving more money, investing more money. At the big event coming up February 15th, I'm going to talk about one, one of the stocks that I'm looking to buy um, and some of the stocks that I currently own. That's going to be before the event. Um, if you want to show up, <laughs> 6.30, 8.30. In Menlo Park, it is the seven steps for retirement readiness. 6.30 to 8.30, Menlo Park at the Stanford Park Hotel. Great parking, great restaurant too. Um, <clears throat> like I rarely eat at places that I speak at, but it's yeah. delicious. Anyhow, if you have at least 500,000 investable assets, this event's for you. The seven steps for retirement readiness. If you're 50, 55, 60, 65, This event's great. You learn about taxes, income, long-term care, safe money, investing, life goals, and how they all work together. Tax efficiency is tied towards your tax uh, past few years, and then they project your next few years to to figure out the best ways to save money. Uh, Tie it in together with your income, your Social Security. It all makes sense. Sign up at robblackshow.com. It's robblackshow.com. Coming up, I'm going to talk about Tom Lee. Think you're in good shape for retirement? Find out how you're really doing with the seven steps for retirement readiness. Join Rob Black and CFP Chad Burton of EP Wealth Advisors Thursday, February 15th in Menlo Park for a live event. Chad will walk you through these seven steps to find out whether you are really ready for the retirement you want. Rob will provide timely commentary and Chad will share specific strategies strategies for taxes, income, long-term care, safe money, investing, life goals, and more. If you have at least 500000 in investable assets and want to gauge where your retirement stands, pass on your estate, and create tax efficiencies, this event is for you. The 7 Steps for Retirement Readiness, Thursday, February 15th, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Stanford Park Hotel in Menlo Park. Space is limited, so sign up today at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Can you pass all seven tests? Sign up online today at robblackshow.com. Got a couple emails yesterday, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about fun strats Tom Lee. One email says, can you talk about fanatics and the various lawsuits regarding Panini trading cards, antitrust, as well as DraftKings lawsuit with fanatics and how they are butchered the Super Bowl jerseys? And the answer is no, I can't. 
Um, I do see jerseys. I do see trading cards as assets, but they're but they're kind of beneath me. I'm not being mean, and if that's something you want to follow, absolutely follow it. But I can't tell you the difference between a Pokemon rare card and one that's counterfeit. I can't. And I have really no interest in learning that. There's only so much space in every human's brain. And mine quickly tells me, um, mm, not a good idea to follow that one. And then this, that email has some like weird stuff in it. Like, <clears throat> so I'm guessing he doesn't invest in the regular good old stock market. I guess like Meta is beneath him or investing in Apple is beneath him or the S&P 500. But there was kind of a tone. Did you pick it up on it? Um, can you talk about the fanatics and the various lawsuits regarding Panini trading cards, antitrust? Um, when you start talking about lawsuits and things that you want to go higher in value, I think you're pretty in too deep. Okay, got another email from, uh, I won't say his name because it's kind of unique. Uh, let's just say it starts with F. He goes, hi, Rob. I love your segments on Cron 4. I do do a segment on Cron 4 er, Monday through Thursday. I post it on my YouTube channel, Rob Black Show. Rob Black Show. He says, what do you think about Quantum State? I've been thinking about investing in their stocks. Now, I know Quantum State, Escape, it's coming up with a battery for electric vehicles that's better. Charges faster, goes further, weighs less. I see it in newspapers, um, in investment let, in investment papers, in investment sections. Newsletters is what I was trying to find for. I think it's a very controversial stock. To me, it feels pumped. There's no revenue. There's no earnings. There's just a lot of press releases. And in the end, I like press releases for sure. It's, it's part of investing. But when you invest, you got to do a little bit of homework and you got to look at the financials. Revenue is important. How much cash do they have is important. To me, they keep sending out these press releases that are sensational. We're going to beat Tesla. We've got the best battery on the market. We're developing technology that if it breaks through, it's going to be the biggest, bestest ever. And yeah, they may have a legitimate partner who's keeping an eye on the technology. Uh, in this case, something like a Volkswagen. But that doesn't mean that it's legit and it doesn't mean that it's ready for a prime time. It could be five to 10 years, 15 years out. Um, if you want to own something like this, you own one or 2%. And if it goes to zero, you're not bankrupt. And if it hits a home run, you're like, woohoo! But they burn a lot of cash. There's zero revenue, zero earnings, zero dividend. Not shareholder friendly because they keep issuing more shares. Me, I avoid. I want companies that are earning money, growing revenue, successful managements that have uh, made money for shareholders in the past. I like product that's actually out there that's not being developed. So anyway, this man with his name F says, thanks for the advice. He responds. He agrees with me. Um, he said, a friend recommended this one to me. Right there is the problem. And he said, this friend also is recommending another company. And that stock's not doing well either. Should I buy that one? I'm like, what's wrong with you? Don't you learn? Stop listening to the friend. All you're doing is gambling. Yeah, I can find a stock that's a buck, two bucks. I can find a stock that's developing the, the cure for cancer. But if it doesn't, you go to zero. I like companies with 100 million users like Spotify, like Apple, like Google, like Microsoft, like NVIDIA. Everyone should have a diversified portfolio and not just go with the growth stocks. But the growth stocks are fun to talk about, but at least I'm finding companies with 100 million users. Call me crazy, right? Anyhow, let's move on. Let's talk a little Tom Lee. I, I like Tom Lee. He says a, um, he's with a company called Fundstrat. Last year, he was very bullish on the market. And he was the most bullish and he was the most right because a lot of us in the financial media markets, the economists, the strategists, the portfolio managers, they were all predicting a recession at the end of the year was very likely and it didn't happen. And he said, you know, I think the S P 500 goes higher. I think the S P 500 goes higher. He'd be on CNBC all the time. He's Asian American. He's got glasses. He's very unique looking. If you ever see him, you'll go, I know who that guy is. Um, he says recently a stock market correction appears imminent after the S&P 500 rallied 21% over 14 weeks. So here he's saying for something a little negative, like, boo, no, yay. This guy's made you money. He's basically saying there will be a buying opportunity coming. He thinks we might be approaching something close to 5,000, maybe a little higher. And then he thinks a, down, a drawdown follows. He thinks the round number of 5,000 is the area where people will say, okay, Let's pause and reflect. 
It's a big number, and I totally get it. Uh, people, I, when I work at Cron TV station in the Bay Area, um, anytime the Dow or the NASDAQ hits a big round number, um, like Dow 40,000, they'll have me come in studio and, and talk about it. So right now, the S&P 500, which Tom Lee said, right around 5,000, it's looking pretty imminent that a pullback should happen. It's at 49.87. So I'm taking from that, and again, I don't just listen to one person, but I'm taking from that, maybe I can have a little bit of cash I can hold on to and see if something develops that I like. He looked at the market history and found seven instances since 1927 when the S&P 500 rose 13 out of 14 weeks, as it just did. In four of those seven instances, the stock market peaked within the next two weeks. He said an imminent market correction also makes sense because it would mimic a stock market trading pattern that last occurred during the last bear market, uh, that during the bear market in the the market low in October of 2022. Stock market jumped 20% for 16 weeks starting in October 2022 before it staged a 9% correction. Then it rallied 21% over the next 19 weeks before it sold off by 11%. Let me repeat that. He said the stock market jumped 20% for 16 weeks between October 22 before it staged a 9% correction. Then it rallied 21% over 19 weeks before it sold off 11%. So twice it, it rallied over 20% and then it sold off between 9 and 11%. Just back in October 22, not when you were a little itty bitty 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 child, but October 2022, a couple years ago. So... I like him. I'm not saying this is religion. I'm not saying this is Bible. I'm saying this is something you should think about when you approach investing. Find people who've made you money or people who understand the markets and think about what they're saying. Big event coming up February 15th, the seven steps for retirement readiness in Menlo Park, California, live Thursday, February 15th, 630 to 830. Sign up at robblackshow.com. For more information about EP Wealth, visit robblack.com. That's robblack.com. Thanks for listening to the show. You can always find it on Spotify, YouTube, Apple, anywhere you get podcasts as well as broadcasts um, under Rob Black Show or Rob Black and Your Money. Joining me now, Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com. Good morning, Patrick. How are you? Good morning, Rob. I'm doing well. Thank you. So this is the only day that I don't start my day by looking at your column because I kind of want to keep things fresh. Um, but I do start my market morning news cycle, uh, Monday, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Fridays with your content. Um, uh, page one, what are we looking at? And we're, we're deep into earning season at this point in time, which it feels kind of good. It's, it's kind of an exciting time. Are you feeling the excitement or are you feeling a buildup? What are you feeling? Well, there's uh, kind of mixed emotions, I think, which is also consistent with with the market. Um, okay. You know, you, you have parts of the market that are doing quite well. Uh, one in particular we all know about, <laughs> the mega cap universe. Not all mega caps, but uh, in, in general, most of them are, you know, outperforming here. And uh, that's making a, a key difference for the market cap weighted S&P 500, which is up. Uh, about 4.7% year to date versus the equal weighted 500, which is only up about 0.4% year to date. So, uh, and then uh, we layer in kind of the uh, weak performance out of the small caps this year, thus far anyway, down about 4% in the Russell 2000. And then the mid caps, um, you know, down almost about a percent year to date. So, um, so it's just it's a mixed story here, but because you have the enduring strength of those major leadership stocks in the mega cap universe, uh, you have a quote market end quote that is holding up reasonably well. That's right. Now I'm going to take a leap of faith here that you're going to follow me. But do you feel like most of the market participants feel comfortable with mega cap? names because they have such great cash flow, strong earnings, stock buybacks. One of them recently introduced a dividend versus the small caps, the Russell 2000, which you say have underperformed thus far. I noted that you said thus far, but last year, the Russell 2000 had a great October, November, December, and had a pretty good year, but it all came late and the small caps have regional banks in them. 
um, a lot, a lot more than the big caps. And I don't know, is there something to be said about the short-term catch-up of the Russell 2000 versus the longer term? I feel pretty comfortable this company has billions of dollars mega cap stocks. Well, you know, the other thing that the mega caps have going for them right now, just from huh. identification purposes anyway, sure. why people do feel more comfortable uh, is is that, you know, they have, uh, you know, strong balance sheets, great cash flow. You know, these are quality companies, and and many of them continue to deliver double digit growth, uh, top and bottom line. And you know, they haven't really uh, spooked their shareholder base into thinking that you know a seminal shift in their business activity is at hand anytime soon. Here, um, you know, I don't think anyone is. Uh, Questioning Nvidia's growth prospects here. Uh, Microsoft, you know, we saw Microsoft sell off a little bit after its earnings report, but it had rallied so strongly into the report. And you know, and right away, people were in buying the weakness. And I yep. think that that's kind of the the perspective right now is that they're delivering such strong results still that people are willing to buy into the weakness in those names, and they feel comfortable doing that. And in some cases, as you allude to, they actually, you know, are getting paid a dividend uh, along the way. Small caps, um, something I mentioned in the page one column uh, this morning, is, you know, they've not done well here to start the year, but we can't forget that they were just on fire at the end of last year. That Russell 2000, you know, gained about, I think, 27% or so just between the low in October and the high in December. So it's, I guess you could say, you know, not unexpected that you would see some consolidation activity here, but, you know, there are some flies in the ointment uh, that you mentioned, one in particular being the the regional bank issue that is kind of starting to make some waves here of of, of anxiousness anyway, certainly in the case of New York Community Bank. Um, But there's been some weakness there that's kind of kept uh, the Russell 2000 in check. And of course, we have had the shift in rate cut expectations early this year that probably has taken a little bit of the shine off of the, um, you know, the growth potential that many saw um, for the small caps at the end of last year when uh, the outlook called for, uh, for, well, not the Fed's outlook anyway, but the market's outlook called for six rate cuts. And now that's being dialed back a bit. It is being dialed back a bit. Um, great answer, by the way. Patrick O'Hare, you do not disappoint. I throw a weird curveball at you, and you didn't know that was coming. You did great with it. Um, further on in your page one this morning, I'm reading now that you, you highlight better than expected results from Ford and Chipotle Mexican Grill, but you also balance that with the 30% fallout in Snap. What's interesting is Meta had a great quarter with advertising, and Snap's kind of in the same business on a smaller scale. Um, Chipotle, uh, I saw something pretty interesting on that. They never miss uh, their numbers, and they do well with low-income, mid-income, and high-income consumers, which is kind of a sweet spot in the world of fast food. Any thoughts on Ford, Chipotle, or Snap? Well, one, one thing that comes to mind is, you know, as a market analyst and looking at the the impact of it, obviously – Snap's 30% plunge is, is eye-opening, right? right? It, you know, catches everyone's attention. Um, you know, Snap's market cap is $18 billion, okay? Meta platforms, $1.2 trillion, right? So as we think about, you know, stocks that are going to have kind of like impact on the market, Snap is not it. <laughs> you know, Snap is, um, you know, a very company-specific issue. It's what it appears to be right now anyway. Uh, and it's, it's paying the price for it. You know, um, it was a former growth darling, and it's just not living up to, you know, uh, investors' expectations. And, and, you know, a 30% decline in any stock pretty much speaks for itself as to what the perspective is on the the company's performance. Um, But, you know, you get a a 3% move in meta platforms like we're seeing today, and it has just such a disproportional impact in terms of having influence on the broader market that, you know, Snap is is barely even a drop in the bucket um, from that standpoint. Um, and, and I think that's the distinction, you know, what we just talked about, you know, that's being drawn here and why, you know, the market itself continues to hold up well because you have these massively weighted companies continuing to uh, to outperform. And it does make a difference, like it or not, in the performance of the index, you know, which uh, is composed of 500 companies, but 
given the sheer weight of these, you know, mega cap names, um, a handful of them can can make a difference in the market's performance. It's interesting because I think the retail investor gets it wrong here. And Snap was a darling, and it's it's off eighty plus percent from its uh, pandemic high, where it did well when we were kind of shut into our homes. But also going back to the mega cap stocks, they're having a great. 15 months now for sure. But if you go back to 2022 and you invest money in the Vanguard value fund versus the mega cap seven, you're actually did better in the Vanguard value fund over the last two years because you were buying when things didn't get as low as they got. And so depressing. Do you think the retail investor gets this wrong? Because, and, and maybe they quit investing because they, they feel like it's a, a no win game for them. Just when they get into snap, it turns bad. Um, they got into mega cap in 2022 and it turned bad. And then 2023, it turned great. Um, and right now everyone wants the mega cap seven sets telling me maybe I should trim <laughs> some positions. Do you think the retail investor is too short-term focused? Cause you and I've done this for 25 years on air. Um, so we are long-term any thoughts. Well, I do think, you know, retail investors are, are caught up in the fascination of, of these you know, lottery ticket stocks, you know, who doesn't like that story, um, thinking that you can double your money in like no time at all, right? It's not easy, right? Um, you might time it right one time, but the next time you get blown up by it. Um, so it's not easy to pick individual stocks. And, uh, and I think probably I would just harken back, you know, to the greatest investor of our age, what his perspective is. Uh, and I'm referring to Warren Buffett. Yep. Right when he dies, he wants basically the vast majority of the wealth he hasn't donated to be put into an S and P 500 index fund, <laughs> you know, or that that would be his advice for uh, for the for the managers uh, of his money uh, for a surviving spouse, you know. And patience is a virtue for the retail investor if they can stay patient. Uh, the, the stock market has loads of history of showing that it's a great wealth generating machine. But you've got to stay in it, and you can't be coming in and out because market timing will be the death of anybody and really take away, um, you know, diminish those return prospects. So it's tough to do it at times, but if you're in a position where you don't need money, um, if you can ride out the volatility, it typically does work out in your favor in the end. I think a couple years ago or many years ago, Warren Buffett challenged a hedge fund, smart hedge fund, great hedge fund over a 10-year period, and he said, this S&P 500 fund will beat your performance. And 10 years later, he was right. Um, so it's not necessarily smart money is the way to go. Sometimes it is, like you said, patience. Um, we got under a minute. Is there anything that you want to hit? Well, I would say uh, patience and low fees. Uh, you know, that's yeah. really one of, the, one of the things that Mr. Buffett has emphasized why uh, it's very difficult for actively managed funds to outperform an index fund through the fees alone. But, uh, but that said, you know, um, we are looking at a market here that I, I've been tossing, turning this over my head. But if you're an index investor, right, you own the S&P 500 index. So what you want are positive returns. How you get them probably makes or should make very little difference in the end. Because um, if you have a handful of stocks that can move this index, you're going to capitalize from it. Um, the risk now is concentration risk, but ultimately uh, you're getting paid for the performance of these names as uh, you would hope as an index investor. It's Patrick O'Hare with briefing.com, a reliable source of domestic and international news you can use. I start my week every day with it and end my week every day with briefing.com. This interview featured on the Rob Black Show is brought to you by EP Wealth. Learn more at robblack.com. Uber beat on or beat estimates as revenue and bookings saw double digit growth. Stock was down a little bit in the daily short term performance after they announced earnings this morning. Um, I'm not worried about that. I own shares of Uber. It is one of the companies that I see as a total addressable market winner. IE it has more than 100 million users and the only time I use Lyft is when I get a promotion from my credit card that says, we'll give you a free ride or we'll bump you to the front of the line, something along those lines. Let's look at Uber's numbers. Uber reported net income of $1.4 billion. Last year, $595 million. That's an amazing year over year. If you could do that, if you were living in, in uh, Jack and the Beanstalk world, 
i.e. a fairy tale, and you were to tell your spouse, hey, honey, I'm going to the market with these magic beans, and you come back with a pot of gold, and she'd be like, ooh, you turned magic beans into a pot of gold. $595 million into $1.4 billion is pretty impressive. Now, they did have $1 billion in unrealized gains from revaluations for its equity investments. So that's a little, eh. Revenue for the quarter, revenue for the quarter was up 15% compared to the last same last year. Again, if you were to tell me, you go on Shark Tank and, you, and they go, what were your sales last year? And you said, um, X, and what are your sales this year? X plus 15%. That's pretty good. Uber's gross bookings came in at $37.6 billion, up 22% year over year. They're using the word sustainable, profitable growth. Wall Street loves sustainable, profitable growth. They continue to see consumer strength and especially consumer strength as it relates to services. People are going out to dinner. They're going out to concerts, sports events. I'm going out to an event this weekend. Um, Oliver Tree in San Francisco or actually in Oakland, I'm sorry. And I'll probably Uber there, right? Uber reported uh, because I don't really feel great about parking my car in Oakland. Um, Just I hear stories, right? It's never happened to me, but I hear stories. And to me, to get in and out of a concert, I feel a little bit more comfortable about it. But if I go to San Francisco, I live about five miles outside of San Francisco. I Uber in for dinner. Um, Sports events, I Uber to the closest location that I can to walk into the event. Not always, but more often than not. When you see parking at 60 bucks or 70 bucks or 100 bucks, you're like, no. So Uber reported um, a pretty good quarter. Mobility. Which is gross bookings nineteen point three billion, up twenty nine percent year over year. Delivery was seventeen billion, up nineteen percent year over year. So, whether you're driving around or you're having food brought to you or goods brought to you, they've got two different segments. They're they're owning the business. The company's freight business booked one point two billion in sales for the quarter, a seventeen percent year seventeen percent decline year over year. Freight continues to be a sticking point. I would imagine freight could get spun out of the company. Um, but they're seeing glimmers of light in terms of spot freight rates. They are a logistics company. They are a technology company on information of how to move people, food, and product around the world. Is it appropriate for you? I don't know. I bought it last year for the first time. As I saw year over year, they're going to be profitable going forward. And I saw their market cap getting to the point where they could be added to the S&P 500. Those were two of my flags. The other one, maybe they were better than Lyft. In my head, the, between the two, Uber is one, right? Um, this is a next catalyst, probably a dividend, but that's probably two to three years away. Again, do not buy it because I own it. But I bought it last year in, let's see if I can find my price, uh, $32. So it's at 70 now. Not a bad one-year return. Do I like it in the short term? I do. Um, do I expect a pullback after it's doubled in the last year? I do. Will I panic? No. If it's 10, 15, 20%, I may add to my position. Um, do I like it in midterm? Yes. Do I like it in the long term? Yes. Especially competitively compared to Lyft. Now, again, is it appropriate for you? I don't know. I think Uber's filing, firing on all cylinders right now. Um, and they have a CEO who seems to care. Now, again, before they had Travis Klanick. And he was a CEO who didn't care. In my opinion, public's perception could be wrong here, right? But it seemed like a boys club. It seemed a little bit like a tech bro. And that just wasn't for me. Um, it's something that turned me off. Like, I, I think Tesla's doing a lot of great things, but a lot of what Elon Musk is doing is kind of silly. Um, he seems to want to see his opinions worldwide talked about every two days. Um I don't like the drug use that's publicly known. I don't mind if you do drugs in the privacy of your own home, but it should never, ever, ever get out. There's a big article this weekend about how some board members on Tesla feel compelled to do drugs with him, whether it's the money or being relevant next to him. There's a com- compulsion to do drugs with him. Now, again, I don't even know if that story has any fact checks to it, but it, it makes me go, yeah, I don't want to own that one. I hate losing money. I don't know about you, but I hate it. Um, Anything you want to talk about, we could talk about money investing and more. Let's talk about, uh, let's do a quick little quiz, shall we? 
Um, I like quizzes because they can be informative. Which the following is the top way that fintechs worldwide acquire customers? Is it A, referrals? Fintech is a financial tech company. Is it B, websites? Is it C, social media? Is it D, partnerships with local financial institutions? And the answer is C, social media. 70% of fintechs worldwide use social media to acquire new customers, followed by referrals, 68%. Then there are websites, 65%. Um, I'm a little bit cautious on saying this fintech's great. In large part, things change. Um, I used to use a company in the past called Mint. Money Intelligence is what it stood for, mint.com. And it was a great budgeting uh, platform. One. So you could put in your bank accounts and it would tell you how much you're spending on food, on entertainment and such. Um, but then they got acquired. And now the new uh, big one is, is like, it's like it's on to the next one, right? So I don't talk too much about it. I do like Rocket Money. Um, and I do use it myself to find subscriptions. And Rocket Money is getting into what Mint used to do, budgeting. And you know they're getting a little wide. But the only reason I use Rocket Money is, is to keep track of subscriptions. I um, hate it when I get double billed on anything. I hate it when I'm using something, getting charged for something I'm not using. Anyway, and anyhow, come out to the big event February 15th. It's the seven steps uh, for retirement readiness. You can learn more about the event at robblackshow.com. It's February 15th, 6.30 to 8.30 in Menlo Park, the seven steps for retirement readiness. Last time we're going to be doing this event for a long time. Sign up at Rob Black Show. Think you're in good shape for retirement? Find out how you're really doing with the seven steps for retirement readiness. Join Rob Black and CFP Chad Burton of EP Wealth Advisors Thursday, February 15th in Menlo Park for a live event. Chad will walk you through these seven steps to find out whether you are really ready for the retirement you want. Rob will provide timely commentary and Chad will share specific strategies for taxes, income, long-term care, safe money, investing, life goals, and more. If you have at least 500000 in investable assets and want to gauge where your retirement stands, pass on your estate, and create tax efficiencies, this event is for you. The 7 Steps for Retirement Readiness, Thursday, February 15th, 6.30 to 8.30 p.m. at the Stanford Park Hotel in Menlo Park. Space is limited, so sign up today at robblackshow.com. That's robblackshow.com. Can you pass all 7 tests? Sign up online today at robblackshow.com.